I'd like to welcome everyone to the second of the Marshall Lectures for 2015-16. Uh, these lectures are being delivered by Professor Rajan, the uh, Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, and uh, Professor at the Chicago Booth School. Um, and uh, yesterday he um, introduced us to ways of thinking about why banks, which are a very particular institution, um, why, how can one think about them, how can one think about the kind of functions they perform, and why would it make sense for them to have the very particular structure they have um, in terms of receiving deposits that can be withdrawn at any moment and funding longer term um, investments. So in other words, this mismatch between their demand, their, their assets and their liabilities uh, what could be the sorts of reasons which might justify this mismatch, which is a source of much concern and um, has been you know, the heart of discussions about what to do with banks. So today, I, I think he's going to build on that lecture. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, present Professor Rajan to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, before I start, uh, uh, let me offer a disclaimer for any members of the press or anybody who's blogging uh, um, for the press here, that none of what I say today has anything to do with the real world. <laughs> it has no bearing on Fed policy, ECB policy, Bank of England policy, Bank of Japan policy, or RBI policy. So this is not a policy statement anywhere. It's a way of thinking about the real world, which I think one can make connections, but please don't extrapolate from anything I say here uh, to uh, views on, on policy. So yesterday, I, I talked about why we have this peculiar structure of banks, uh, entities fund, funded with very short-term demandable deposits, and uh, uh, which were prone to runs, but which were enduring structures and have, uh, you know, uh, you know, for a, a, for a very very long time, certainly since the Middle Ages, have been structures that have been prevalent across the world. And the question is, why is this structure? Uh, there, what, what efficiency properties does it have? And the argument I made is uh, this is a very efficient form of borrowing, that when you issue short-term demand deposits, uh, it keeps the banker effectively on the straight and narrow in a way that it might not keep a firm owner on the straight and narrow. So firms don't issue demand deposits, but banks do issue demand deposits. And uh, perhaps in the question answer, if, you, if you're unclear about that aspect, I'd be happy to elaborate. But the, uh, the point uh, is best, uh, perhaps, uh, 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 best understood if you think about a, um, if I were to come to you and say, I want to uh, take some money from you. Please invest in me. I have this wonderful idea. Um, you know, it's going to be financing a whole bunch of things. Don't ask me what I'm going to finance. I'm going to finance a whole bunch of things. Trust me. Give me the money, and I'll come back to you sometime. And uh, if I'm successful, I'll pay you back. Okay? So if I give you this kind of proposition, uh, you're going to be very wary about funding me, right? That's, that's because I, what I'm asking you effectively is for an equity contract, an equity contract in which you hold equity in me essentially allows you to ask no questions, doesn't allow you to expect a dividend until I'm good and ready to pay it. And before that, you have absolutely no rights if you're a dispersed equity holder, right? On the other hand, if I say, look, I have all these interesting projects. Trust me, I'll do the right thing. But I give you the right, if you don't trust me, to come tomorrow and ask for your money back. And I'm obligated to pay you any time you ask for your money back. Now, perhaps under those circumstances, you might be um, you know, persuaded to give me some money or at least test me out. Because you have some control over me, you can always get your money back. And you can keep testing that and see if you get your money back. Eventually, you might let it 
lie for a little while. That's really, to some extent, uh, why demand deposits would allow the banker to raise money at a lower cost and perhaps more money than he would be able to if he issued equity claims. And yesterday what I showed you was that a mix of uh, equity claims and demand deposits would come at a higher cost than purely demand deposits. Of course, the benefit of having some equity claims in your capital structure, in your liability structure as a, as a bank, is there's some buffering. That if, if there is an adverse shock, your asset values fall, much of the hit to the, uh, uh, of that shock is absorbed by the equity, and your depositors did not necessarily run. So that's what we did yesterday. What I want to talk about today is how to apply this. Um, now, uh, another way of thinking about this is yesterday I gave you a structure which was uh, standing alone. And I didn't talk about what the interaction between banks was, what the interaction between customers were. I didn't talk very much about an uncertain environment. There was some uncertainty. And so now we want to put the structure of the bank in a wider, somewhat more realistic environment. Not realistic enough to tell the Fed what policy to make, but a little more realistic than we were yesterday. Okay? What I'm going to do is, is do what is called general equilibrium. And some of you undergrads uh, have encountered gen general equilibrium. I would argue that in many ways, perhaps the most important lesson we have to give as economists to policy makers is the notion of general equilibrium. In other words, a, an action by itself cannot be judged in isolation. It has to be judged as other players in the system react to that action, as prices react, as quantities react. And the outcome of all this is really what the effect of a policy is. A lot of policymakers think partial equilibrium. I do this, and that's the entire effect. And so, uh, for example, if I make licensing, um, you know, a car license, getting a car license stricter, that will have the effect of producing better drivers on the road. Because you have to think about what happens when you make the car license stricter, that people will find ways to try and get around the car license and find ways to uh, essentially avoid the licensing process. And if that's a very effective uh, uh, mechanism in, in a developing market, making the license stricter may not actually get you better drivers on the road, right? Uh, Another example is uh, uh, Sam Peltzman's famous work on seat belts. And what he found was the introduction of seat belts uh, and the requirement that you put on seat belts before you drive actually raised the level of car accidents and uh, uh, did more damage. So is the implication that seat belts cause more damage? No, I mean, generally when you belt up, you're safer. But what people hadn't thought about was the general equilibrium consequences. When I put on my seat belt, I not only feel safer, I drive more aggressively. And therefore, I get into more accidents. And that was the result that he found. So that's general equilibrium. We're going to put the bank into general equilibrium today. And you'll see how it works in a second. So um, what I want to do is talk about response to crisis. Now, this paper was written shortly after the great financial crisis. Uh, the paper on which this work is based. And basically, it's, it's talking about the fundamental problem we talked about last time, that banks are structured with demand deposits. And therefore, if there's a generalized illiquidity in the economy. Remember, if the illiquidity is only that one uh, depositor wants his money back, the bank can solve that by borrowing from another depositor and paying the first depositor back, right? So, Individual liquidity problems are solved by the bank. The problem comes if there's a general liquidity shortage in the system, that there is too little liquidity in the system, and I'll show you precisely what I mean in a real model in, in a second. But if there's too little liquidity in the system, then banks may face problems because the demand depositors can get liquidity, but there may not be enough to go around for all the banks. That's a liquidity shortage, and uh, that generally will precipitate a crisis in the banking system. It precipitates a crisis for any entity that has long-term assets and short-term liabilities. 
um, uh, increasingly some investment banks which were hit by the crisis, as well as some insurance companies. Now, there are two ways of reacting to it, many ways, but let me focus on two. If, in fact, banks have this problem, if, in fact, insurance companies have this problem, I can go institution by institution and bail them out, one institution at a time. Okay? It can be a generalized bailout. I bail out institutions. Um, I can also, in the process, you may have heard a lot of talk about bail-ins in, uh, in, in the discussion of regulation. I can force some of the debt to be written down. I can bear, uh, force some of the debt holders to also bear some of the costs. But generally, I'll, impose the, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll help the institution by providing it adequate funds to pay most of the debt holders. I might write down the debt a little bit. Okay? So that would be a bailout. The other way I can deal with the problem of generalized illiquidity, it turns out, is reduce interest rates in the system. Bring down the level of interest rates in the system and keep them down for a little while. Okay? That will create solvency in the system, uh, in a sense deal with the liquidity problem, and I'll, I'll make all these things much more clear as I go into the model, and it will restore stability. So monetary policy, cutting interest rates, is indeed a way to restore stability to the system when it's impacted by crisis. Cutting interest rates sharply in the face of a crisis is probably a good action by the central banks. But the question is, which method makes more sense? Does it make sense to intervene individually and bail out the institutions? Does it may make sense to have a generalized implicit bailout by cutting interest rates and uh, essentially rendering the system solvent? What are the costs of these? That's what this, this paper is going to, uh, this, this talk is going to look at. And the point that we're going to arrive at is that interest rate policy is probably better in the context of the model I talked about yesterday of what banks are, because it's across the board and doesn't focus on specific banks. It basically gives a boost to the entire system without a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, action. And, and I'll tell you why the case-by-case -case action is, is costly. However, to argue that accommodative monetary policy, cutting interest rates sharply, is not a subsidy, essentially misses the point that somebody is paying for it. And I'll tell you who precisely is paying for that in the context of the model turns out that is the saver who's paying for this in a particular way, one particular set of savers, and we'll talk about that. So that is, to some extent, uh, the preferred form of bailout is through monetary policy, but the cost is certain segments of your saving population are essentially paying for the bailout. They're paying for the bailout uh, to the banks, and um, uh, that is the cost exposed of staying low for long that this set pays a high price, okay? Now, there's an additional problem which comes, and that's, that's, that I highlight in the paper, that anticipating such a bailout, anticipating the fact that in reaction to a crisis, the central bank toolkit essentially means cutting interest rates to the bone and letting the, firm, uh, letting the banks sort of recover, banks know this is gonna happen. And therefore, it creates an incentive to do the wrong kind of thing. And the wrong kind of thing takes two forms. One is excessive leverage on the part of the banks. And the second is much more illiquid projects up front. So anticipating the bailout through monetary policy action, especially sustained uh, interest, low interest rates for long, uh, banks will do the wrong kind of thing. And so the question is, what can monetary authorities do to offset this incentive, knowing fully well that they can't avoid intervening? That if the banking system is collapsing, they're not going to sit by the sidelines and say, well and good, these guys should have a lesson, should be taught a lesson. They are going to intervene. They are going to intervene willy-nilly, but how did they offset the moral hazard created by this anticipated intervention and uh, that's where I'll come to the final uh, prescription of the paper. So that's where we're going. It's based on a paper which, uh, again, with Doug Diamond in the Journal of Political Economy uh, in 2012. There's a related paper, if I have time, I'll talk about, which is in the QJ, which talks about, again, aggregate liquidity shortages. So 
what I want to do is walk through these steps. First, I'll talk a little bit about the model, uh, analyze the basic problem for you, talk about interventions. So the basic problem is going to suggest that there could be a system-wide crisis when the conditions uh, of this model apply. And then authorities, call it a central bank, have the ability to intervene. The question is, should they intervene through bailouts? or should they intervene by cutting interest rates? Should they be, um, uh, uh, which one of these should pick? Uh, should they pick, and I will argue it's cutting interest rates is probably better in the context of our model. However, it has other, other features. The model has it that we'll talk about and what this implies for policy longer term. So, this is the model, very quickly like yesterday, the matchstick model uh, with a little more trappings than yesterday. Um, we have a bunch of households, three dates in this model, 0, 1, 2. Um, at date 0, we have households, each one uh, endowed with a unit of good, which is the required input for production. So households can either keep the good, consume it, or they can invest in a bank and get a demand deposit in return. Uh, goods are in short supply relative to projects, so uh, because projects are high return, typically uh, they will be invested in the projects. The households themselves have no production opportunities. They can't produce anything, but they can lend them to the banks, and the banks can lend them to the entrepreneurs. So exactly the same structure as yesterday, if you remember. And um, as, of, as with yesterday's model, banks are needed to force the entrepreneur to repay. Okay? Now, households are risk averse and consume, can consume either at date one or date two or both. And their utility function is log of C1 plus log of C2. Now, um, I'll, I'll uh, say what this means in a second. Don't worry too much if, uh, if you're worried about the utility function. I'll tell you what it does. And uh, they each households uh, today have that unit of good, but they also get an additional endowment. They get some income. And they don't quite know how much income they're going to get. There are two types of households. One gets very high income, and that income is going to show up uh, um, at, uh, uh, at day two, that, that is E2H, uh, and the other household gets low income E2L. Both of them get the same income at date one. They can get variable income at day two, okay? So this is the structure of the model, different households. Households learn which type they are, high income or low income households at date one, and uh, the a household with high income essentially has a high growth rate of income. Now, let me ask you the question. You're all students of economics. If I am a high income household, okay, um, I, I find that at day two I have high income. Will I consume more at date one or less at date one than the household which knows it has low income at day two? Any students? Uh, you're supposed to ask me questions later, but I get to ask you questions now. The high income household will consume more at date one when it knows it's high income at date two, right? And essentially what's going on is when it has high income, it says I need to smooth income. That's what log utility does for you. It makes you risk averse, wants you to smooth income. And so, uh, smooth consumption, I should say, smooth consumption. And what it's saying is I've got high income at day two. Why starve myself today when I'm going to be uh, rich as a, as a billionaire next time, uh, next period? So let me consume more today, okay? So um, what is an interest rate? An interest rate in this model is a marginal rate of substitution between consumption at day two and consumption at day one. That's effectively what an interest rate is. If you didn't understand what that meant, let me just explain that uh, if there are more high income households, households that expect higher income at day two, what do you think the interest rate will be like in this model? The prevailing interest. Remember the interest rate is trying to squeeze savings from the uh, depositors and get them to deposit in the bank. So the interest rate between date one and date two, if there are more high income households, is it going to be high? or low? High, why? Because uh, if interest rate is high, it gives them an incentive to save. Yes. Rather than to spend. Right. 
Exactly. So here's the here's the argument. This is general equilibrium of, uh, in this in this in this matchstick model. Essentially, the more high-income households there are, the more households want to consume today, right? So in order to uh, get any savings from these guys, you have to pay them more for them to leave their money in the bank or to save. And therefore, you need a higher interest rate the more high income guys uh, there are, the more high anticipated income guys there are. So um, that's one way of, of playing out this model, that um, there are these households, some high type, some low type, and the uncertainty in the mon uh, model is how many of each type there are. And think of a state as being higher when there are more high income households. So higher states are states when the prevailing interest rate in the model will be higher. Because you're trying to keep money into investment, you have to pay a higher rate for investment because all these guys see wonderful things happening, they want to withdraw today. Okay? Now it turns out that in this kind of model, you can get exactly the same result if tomorrow is fixed, that is the uh, future, everybody gets the same endowment, but today some households get a low endowment and other households get a high endowment. In this case, when it's today, that is date one, when the endowment is variable, and there are more households with high endowment, what will the interest rate be as, as there are more households with high endowment? Same, same problem, just reversed. It will be low because as I have more households with high endowment, right, they see a low endowment or, or, or lesser endowment in the future and they're saying, well, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be a pauper, today I'm a billionaire, right, uh, therefore, uh, why don't I save some more for tomorrow? And therefore, what it takes to get them to save is much less than in the earlier, in a situation where there are fewer of them, right? So interest rates in this model are determined by the number of households, and what matters is the rate of consumption growth. And if there are more households which have a higher rate of consumption growth, interest rates are higher. Okay, that's, that's the takeaway from this model. So um, let's assume that we're talking about the basic model. Aggregate consumption growth will be higher in higher states, requiring a higher real interest rate. Okay, so that's the liability side of this model. Uh, then on the asset side, remember the uh, uh, bank is borrowing from depositors. On the asset side, there are entrepreneurs. A uh, project requires a unit input at day zero to produce Y2 in cash flows at day two. This is an illiquid project in the same sense as yesterday. If it is liquidated at date one, you don't get the full cash flows. You get only X2 which is less than, uh, you, you only get x1, which is less than y2, okay? Now, you know, one of the things we did was we wrote this paper about 12 years, 12 years after the first paper. So as we wrote this, we didn't pay attention to notation. And so notation is slightly changed in this paper from the first paper. One of the uh, things that uh, you should keep in mind when you write papers on the same subject. Anyway, yesterday that gamma, uh, uh, let me, let me say that uh, very, very simply. The bank has special abilities, okay? The bank can collect gamma Y2 from the firm, while other ordinary investors can only collect X2. Okay, that's a little different from yesterday. If you don't remember yesterday, great. This is what you have to remember, okay? The bank can collect gamma Y2 from a borrower at date two, or liquidate X1 at date one, and uh, depositors can run and get, get, get some fraction of the X1 or in, X1 entirely, it doesn't matter. But basically the bank can collect a little more than X1 because it has special information, special knowledge. Now, somebody talk, asked me yesterday about diversification. We assume these banks are diversified across all entrepreneurs. So in a sense, there's no uncertainty about the realization of their asset side values. Okay, so the basic commitment problem is that the bank you know, can threaten to not collect as, a, as yesterday. 
which means that if it wasn't disciplined by depositors, it could only promise them X1, which is what they can realize on their own from the, from the entrepreneur. But because it's disciplined by depositors by the threat of the run, it can commit to collect the entire cash flow gamma Y2 and pass it on to the depositors. Okay? So this is the collective action problem in deposits that we talked about yesterday, which is why the bank can pass through everything it collects. Now, uh, given this, the basic decision the bank has to make is how much to offer the depositors. Remember, it's competing with other banks for depositors, and there are many of them. So it'll basically promise to pay the highest amount it can, uh, given uh, uh, all the asset side parameters that, that, uh, that, are, that are there. And we talk about Nash equilibria. Don't worry if, uh, if, you're not, if you haven't encountered it before. It's, it's not, not, not crucial. OK, so here's the timeline of the model so far. Households invest one e each in banks in return for promised payment of D at date one. And that D is rolled over by banks that can roll, roll it over. So there's a demand deposit can be withdrawn at any time. Uh, and that any time can be any time between zero and date one. Uh, and then banks lend to entrepreneurs. At date one, the state of the world is re revealed. What is the state of the world? How many high type households there are? In other words, is the rate of growth of household income going to be very strongly positive? If it is very strongly positive, then interest rates will perk up in this economy, and uh, that interest rate is R12. That is the market clearing interest rate uh, which, is, uh, which obtains. At that point, households decide whether to withdraw or stay in. The interest rate should be such that typically they would agree to stay in, except in a situation where the interest rate has moved up so much that the bank is effectively insolvent at that interest rate. Now, why would a bank be insolvent? Remember what the bank is here. It has a bunch of assets which are long term, and it has a bunch of deposits which are demandable, which can be demanded at any moment. So at date one, the liabilities the bank has don't vary. They're always fixed at D because it's a demandable deposit. The depositor can come and ask for the face value back. So the present value of the liabilities is always D. But the present value of the assets is gamma Y2 discounted back to date one at the prevailing market interest rate. So if R12, the prevailing market interest rate, goes up very high, it may be the bank doesn't have enough asset value to pay the depositors. And in that case, as soon as depositors understand this and smell this, they're going to run. Okay? So uh, the households decide how much to withdraw and how much to consume. Uh, the bank chooses which loans to liquidate. Uh, and so long as the bank is solvent, there's no problem. But if it's insolvent, it'll face a full run. Even if it's not insolvent, it may still liquidate a number of projects because it has to meet the depositor's demand for liquidity. They want their money back. It may have to liquidate a bunch of projects. At day two, projects mature. The projects that are not liquidated mature. Loans are repaid, and deposits are fully withdrawn from the bank. That's the end everybody consumes. Whoops. OK, so now we're going to talk about the an analysis of the basic problem. And I've already said this four times, so I'll say, say this a, five time, a fifth time. Higher state means more optimists about future growth, greater desire to consume for any interest rate. And as I said, all we're talking about is consumption growth. You can get high consumption growth if the future is very positive. You can get high consumption growth if the current situation is very bleak. If today is very bleak, that's another reason for me to withdraw because uh, the future is better than today. I want to withdraw to consume. So more projects in that case have to be liquidated to satisfy consumption needs. And the market clearing deposit interest rate rises to equate the goods obtained from liquidation to the goods that are withdrawn by the depositors to consume. So there's an equilibrium. And uh, the point here is as the interest rate increases, the asset values fall. And the bank gets closer and closer to insolvency. At some point, insolvency is reached for the bank and there's a bank run and everything is liquidated. Okay? And just like yesterday, bank runs 
are extremely costly and they stem from a high demand for liquidity which creates bank insolvency. Okay? Now this is different from yesterday. This demand for liquidity is different because I can't simply replace it by, from, by someone else. I can replace it for a little while but in case interest rates have gone up so much there's not enough liquidity in the market to get it from somewhere else at the interest rate I can pay and therefore I am run at that point that depositors then think me insolvent and, and run. Okay, so what happens in a run? We talked about this yesterday. The bank liquidates all loans, even those that are worth much more in the future. Remember, these loans pay Y2, which is a very high number, compared to the liquidation value X1, which is a somewhat lower number. But I inefficiently have to liquidate because I can't be trusted to pay in the future, and only a fraction of the households get their money. Remember in a bank run, the households in front of the line get their money, the households in the back of the line don't. I owe deposits worth D, I have assets worth only X1, so a fraction X1 by D of the depositors will get their money back, the rest who are at the back of the line will not. Okay? So there are two sources of problems from the run. The first is that even good projects get liquidated, that's a bad thing. Second is some guys get their money in hold, the guys at the front of the line, while the guys at the back of the line get nothing. So there's insufficient risk sharing also between the depositors, and that's a bad thing for the economy. So runs are bad, okay, in this, economy, in this, in this model, just like in the real world. So um, what happens then anticipating this? Anticipating the fact that this uncertainty can cause runs, the banker will set the deposit rate. And typically it turns out that if there's likely to be strong consumption growth that th those states are more likely in the economy at date one, I'm going to reduce the level of leverage because I know that I would be subject to a lot of liquidity stress if those, those states actually materialize at date one. On the other hand, if the states in which uh, there is consumption, strong consumption growth are relatively fewer uh, and um, the probability lies on those kinds of states, then I know interest rates at the interim date are going to be relatively low. I can service my demand deposits and therefore I will set the payment on those de demand deposits higher. And so that's really uh, the, the, uh, the way uh, deposit levels are chosen. Bankers optimally uh, choose a low D with uh, lower expectation of runs if the probability of optimistic states are high. In other words, bankers react. And that's the point I was making about general equilibrium, that in response to the interest rate picture that will evolve at date one, they choose the capital structure so as to buffer themselves against risk. Okay, so that's, that's all fine so far. And um, is there any externality so far in the model? No, nothing. Banks will set D optimally. Uh, and uh, runs are costly. So there is a possibility that a central planner looking at this, a, a central bank looking at this may say, could we do better? Should we just subject the economy to these kinds of runs and say too bad? This has to do with the structure of banking that the kind of rigidity associated with banks which is necessary for the commitment for the banker to commit to repay creates these problems but this is the second best world. We can't do any better than this. This is how the world is, and, and uh, intervention will not, will not help. Okay? Now, some would argue that the problem stems from demand deposits not being state contingent. Okay, what does that mean? If instead of a blanket D up front, I could choose the D commensurate with the state of the world at date one. That is, I see the state of the world, and I have a deposit contract which says, in worlds where more households are really optimistic, we will have a lower D. If the state is such that households are less optimistic, we will have a higher D. So we tailor the D to the degree of optimism of households. That would be a state contingent demand deposit. Okay? Why couldn't we do it? Well, think about how that would work, right? That you would have to have somebody verify the state of the world and say this is a high optimism state 
or this is a low optimism state. Now, if you were to do it in a world with transaction costs, it would take you some time to figure out what the world state of the world is, right? And then you would have to alert all the depositors as of this instant, we are in a high optimism state, so the value of demand deposits is much lower than it was an instant ago. The problem with these kinds of contracts is a little perturbation of the model makes them very fragile. If I know there's going to be a significant change in my deposit, because I am one second faster than the public authorities in understanding that the state is very optimistic, the value of deposit payments is going to be struck down significantly, I run the instant before. And so if you have demand deposits which are based on the state, even if there's any delay in the public authorities in changing the state contingency of those demand deposits, you will precipitate the very runs that you're trying to avoid because people will try and front run the change in the deposit contract. And that makes them very problematic, which is perhaps one reason we don't see uh, the state contingency. Similarly, it's very hard, and trust me on this, I don't want to go into the details, to get demand deposits that distinguish once the households learn their, ability, uh, learn their endowment to distinguish the low endowment household from the high endowment household. And uh, actually, it's, it's not possible in this model to do that. If you have questions on that, I'll, 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 ask, uh, I'll answer in the, in the question answer. But the bottom line is, demand deposits may be the best contracts in this kind of environment. You may not be able to do better. So the only way you can avoid these destructive runs is through exposed intervention. Okay? And let me give you an example of exposed intervention. Supposing the uh, central bank, government, whoever, uh, let's call them all uh, the, the planner, uh, dislikes these runs and wants to avoid them. Uh, what they can do is tax households and give the money back to the banks. They can tax households E1 and transfer them to the banks once they see runs developing. Okay? Uh, an alternative to taxing and giving it to the banks is to borrow from the households and lending it to the banks. And finally, uh, they can also upfront put capital requirements and limit the size of the demand deposits the bankers offer. These are three possibilities. We'll come to each one. But consider the case where the central planner wants to help the banks by giving them uh, endowments that they've taxed from the houses. Remember, all the wealth is centered with the households, right? So they have to take it from the households and uh, essentially give it to the banks so that the banks can repay the houses. They have to circulate the money in that way. Now, the um, problem with this, supposing we know that the central planner is going to tax the households when the banker cannot pay the households enough. They're going to tax the households on their separate wealth, give it to the banks so that the banks will then have a bailout, uh, a certain amount of bailout money which they can then pay to the depositors. Seems circular, but essentially what happens is the depositors get their money. Okay? Now what's wrong with this? Why, why would this have a problem? The problem is that remember there are two reasons for defaults in this model. One was what we talked about last time. One is what we're talking about this time. This time we're saying the environment changed. There were lots of optimistic households. Therefore, there was a demand to withdraw from the bank, and the bank could not meet that demand, which is why it was insolvent. Okay? That's one reason why the bank may not pay. But there's another reason yesterday. What was that reason why the bank may not pay? Second reason. The whole reason you put demand deposits on the bank. What's called strategic default. That, hey, I promised you 20, come take 10. Because I don't want to pay you. Not because I can't pay you, because I don't want to pay you. The problem is, if the authorities are willing to come in and bail out the banks, it's very hard for them to tell the difference between defaults caused by the environment creating insolvency, too many optimistic households, which is beyond the control of the banks, and defaults caused by the banks, which are basically saying, look, somebody is willing to pay us some more money, so we're going to hold you up and extract that. Because with the willingness of the authorities to put in money, I can say, look, 
hey guys, why don't you come in and put in some money into the banks? They can extract what they couldn't extract from the depositors, they can extract from the central planning authorities and say, look, I, you know, I, I don't want to really work hard. I'm willing to precipitate a run. If you pay me some money, if you put in a bailout, then I, I, I'm happy to go on working. So what they could not extract from the depositors, they can extract from the government, okay? So the planner, if this is the case, and the point is, the planner cannot essentially avoid intervention in that case also, in the case where the banker is defaulting strategically, which was the primary reason for the bank, right? Which was the primary reason for demand deposits. So the planner is forced to intervene even more. This is what is called moral hazard. Knowing that the planner is going to come in and bail the bank out with more money, the banker holds out for more rents. And essentially can absorb significant rents. And it turns out that because the banker can absorb significant rents, um, the, uh, essentially the rescue has no effect. Because whatever money is poured in is essentially absorbed by the banker as, 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 uh, as rents. Now, up front, in the ex ante competition, uh, if everybody's uh, competing for funds, it is possible that the banker may then actually elevate the size of the deposits that he'll pay out and essentially pay out also the anticipated rents. So you may have an even worse outcome here, which is that not only does the bailout not help, but it increases leverage up front as the depositors fight for deposits amongst each other and promise to pay out more and more, not just what they can pay out, but also what they can collect from the government in terms of bailout and payout. So essentially the system gets more levered and the level of, of insolvency doesn't change because whatever the government is willing to put in has already been promised out up front. Okay? So the point here is that this kind of intervention where I bail out the bank, if anticipated up front, essentially is at best useless, at worst harmful, because the banker then essentially uh, pays out whatever comes in through higher, uh, higher uh, deposit rates. So um, the point here is that this kind of intervention is, is not very good. Can we do better? Well, instead of giving the money to the bank, supposing instead we intervene to try and reduce the interest rate in the market. Remember the problem, the reason why a number of banks were insolvent was because the interest rate in the market had gone up too high and therefore their asset values had plummeted. Can I, instead of intervening directly bank by bank and essentially putting in money into those banks, which has the problem of feeding the banker rather than necessarily helping the banker out, uh, necessarily helping the bank out, can I do something else? Can I instead reduce the level of interest rates and thereby help the banks? In other words, can I use monetary policy? Now, um, this kind of action is still a bailout because I'm intervening to reduce interest rates. Somebody has to pay for those lower interest rates. People who are enjoying higher interest rates today will enjoy lower interest rates. So they're paying for the bailout. Okay, so it is still a, 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 a bailout, but it doesn't have the same adverse properties that a lot of the rents go to the banker and that in, in, a, in a sense the bailout is ineffective. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But here's where uh, I want to point to one problem uh, we have when we, whenever we're dealing in a real model. How do I reduce interest rates? How do I reduce interest rates? Because interest rates are set by the preferences of consumers in this model. It turns out it's very difficult to get interest rate action in these kinds of real models. That the real interest rate is very hard to change. Central bank action doesn't change real interest rates. Just borrowing and lending doesn't change. Let me show that first. Why simply borrowing and lending doesn't change and what we need to happen in order for the central banker to change interest rates. Let me give you a preview of the reason why borrowing and lending doesn't change. You may think that the central banker borrowing from the households and pumping in money into the market for any bank to borrow should reduce interest rates. Right? That seems obvious. You, you've pushed more 
goods into the market, you've taken goods away, from, borrowed goods from the, uh, from the depositor and pumped it into the market. But if you were a depositor, right, you had some deposits in the bank, and the government came to you or the central bank came to you and said, give me some of your endowment today and I'll pay you back tomorrow, right? Would that force you then to cut down on your consumption? What else could you do? If you, if you really knew that you were getting high endowments uh, um, in the future, today you, you're not consuming very much um, and somebody is actually borrowing something from you, what would you do? You have deposits in the bank. The government has come and issued bonds in the market and borrowed money from you. Where would you, how would you consume more? Since you've lent some money to the government and you know that will, be get, that will get paid back, you can reduce your deposits. You can take out your money from the bank and use that to buy the goods that you want. In other words, whatever you lend to the government, you'll take out from the banks and your consumption profile will not change, right? So in this kind of model, so long as both kinds of households have deposits, any kind of borrowing in the markets from the government or the central bank is fully adjusted for by the, by the um, uh, depositors by withdrawing from the, from the banks. Now, this is a very quick way of describing one of the more important theorems in, in, uh, in economics is called Ricardian equivalence. It's basically saying that households will try and undo what the government does. Uh, when the government issues debt, when the government it does uh, you know, fiscal spending, a whole lot of things the government can do, households can take the opposite side and undo if in fact their preferences suggest that. And that's exactly what it's doing here. It's undoing government borrowing by investing less in the market and it maintains its consumption profile. So in this kind of model, and this is a tweak, it's an interesting tweak, but the only way to get any interest rate action is to get a set of depositors to fully, fully withdraw so that they cannot withdraw any more. Once they've got fully withdrawn, it turns out that the interest rate is determined by the guys who are still inside the system. And that's where the marginal interest rate is determined, and that's why the interest rate falls. Essentially, you create a bunch of non-participants in the, in the system, uh, the high endowment households that, as you reduce the interest rate, essentially think it not worthwhile to leave their deposits in the bank. They withdraw all their deposits. When they're fi fully withdrawn from the system, it turns out the interest rate starts falling. And that's how you get interest rate action. Anyway, that's a, that's a sidelight uh, for, uh, for the greater point uh, that uh, uh, if, uh, this is the point I just made, if all the households uh, undo the loan, the borrowing by the government, which is then given back to the bank, uh, this, this withdrawal has no effect. But if uh, H-type households with high future endowments fully withdraw, then the interest rate is determined by the L-type households. Remember, they are willing to accept a lower interest rate because these households don't see such a major need for consumption today because they don't see much endowment tomorrow. So given they're not going to see much endowment tomorrow, they're happy to save at the relatively low interest rates uh, that prevail. And the market interest rate is set by these guys. One could argue that certain forms of quantitative easing that you see by the central banks are ways to achieve this kind of outcome and to get the interest rate in the system lower. We can talk about that when we get to questions. Uh, but basically, by pushing down the interest rates in the, in the high rate states, banks become just solvent. And as a result, you bail out the system you bail out the banks that are in trouble by pushing down the high interest rates in those periods. Effectively, what the central bank does if it borrows from the system and lends to the banks, uh, lends back into the system, essentially is that it makes the system more state contingent. 
because more funds are available and interest rates are reduced in those high interest rate states, essentially you get state contingency being restored by the central bank, which was not there in the system. You're reducing the rigidity in the system created by the short-term liabilities, all the leverage, by essentially cutting interest rates at the right times in a very significant way. Okay? Now, all you need to take away from this is that there's a difference between the central bank intervening for the system as a whole by pushing down interest rates, which bails out a whole bunch of banks, but bails them out without any direct interaction between the banker and the authorities. It just happens. That is an effective way of intervening in the system to bail out. On the other hand, intervening bank by bank and trying to bail it out allows this, the central authority to be held up by the banker and allows the bank to, to extract rents. There's a difference between the two. One is more anonymous, one is more uh, personalized. The personalized way is a bad way of doing things because it turns out that the banker essentially extracts uh, significant rents from the system. Let me uh, stop a second and check if, uh, if this is reasonably clear. Any, any, well, we're coming to questions very quickly, but, but uh, uh, I think we can, we can elaborate a little more. Uh, uh, okay, so what I want to talk about is, so what's bad with this? Why don't we cut interest rates? Okay, why don't we cut interest rates significantly? One thing we've already argued, it's, it's bad for the depositors because the depositors are getting an interest rate they don't like. The guys who are still sitting in the system are getting a fairly low interest rate compared to what they would otherwise have enjoyed. And the guys who've withdrawn totally basically are withdrawing because they don't like the interest rate on offer. They prefer the higher interest rate that was available earlier. So households are, in fact, paying for these lower interest rates. That is one problem. That's the exposed problem. But ex ante, there is also a problem, which is the banker anticipating that interest rates will be lowered in high interest rate periods because banks will get into difficulty, knows that effectively the central bank is putting a ceiling on interest rates. If interest rates get beyond this point, the central bank will come in and essentially pump the system with money. Okay? Some of you may have heard this referred to as the Greenspan Bernanke put. Uh, no reference to those individuals, but you can think of the central bank as offering a put option in times when interest rates get really high and the system gets into stress, we will come in and flood the system with liquidity. So a banker knowing this, what is their response? Their response is saying, there is less cost to taking high leverage because I know when I have high leverage, the central bank is going to come and bail me out. So leverage goes up higher than it would otherwise be because the cost essentially is borne by the system, not by me. So that's one uh, uh, essential problem, that banks may choose too much leverage. You might argue, well, the way to fix that is to put capital requirements. Let me tell them you can't have le leverage more than a certain amount. You, can't lever you have to have a certain amount of capital. And that's what we do. And that's probably a good thing, if effective. But if banks have ways to get around this leverage requirement by parking all the leverage in special vehicles outside the bank, as was done during the uh, global financial crisis, or effectively levering up in a different way, which I'll come to in a second, then perhaps they can get around the capital requirements. And then this sort of uh, exposed central bank intervention creates moral hazard. That's number one. The second, uh, this, uh, the second problem, I said banks can respond either on the liability side by taking on more leverage. But they can also respond on the asset side. Remember that illiquid assets are costly if I have to liquidate them or if I have to sell them at a discount at an interim date because the interest rate is really high. If I, however, put a ceiling on the interest rate, if the central bank says, if the interest rate goes above a certain level, I will intervene and flood the system with liquidity, these illiquid assets become more attractive. 
So rather than taking on more leverage, I do effectively the same thing by taking on more illiquid assets. Asset illiquidity is essentially the same as taking on leverage in this kind of model. And so um, the preference for illiquid assets increases as the central bank intervenes even more in coming in and capping interest rates or reducing interest rates in the future. So I can do it on either side of the balance sheet. Sometimes we can control the liability side well, but unless we control the bank's ability to get into illiquid positions, the subprime mortgage, the junior tranche of the subprime mortgage-backed security or other kinds of assets, if we, unless we can control that very well, you create incentives to take that kind of illiquidity on in, in times. So what are the implications? As I said, if we intervene ex post, it also implies this case for regulating upfront, for example, through capital requirements. But if capital requirements are ineffective, is there any other way we can change incentives? We, one way to change incentives is to basically commit not to rescue the banking system, right? Uh, in, in the example I gave you of Sam Peltzman where wearing seat belts created more accidents, the way to resolve that would be to drive with a sharpened stake on your steering wheel. So that any time you did something wrong, uh, you felt the full weight of the stake uh, driving through your heart. So uh, that would be the way to solve that. Here it would be a commitment not to intervene, not to bail out the system, so that the system pays the full weight of taking on more leverage. But if you can't stand by and watch the banking system fail, which I think is a fair thing to say of any uh, regulator or, or central banker, you're not going to stand by and watch the system fail, you are going to come in at that time and reduce interest rates. What other alternative do you have to reduce the bad incentives? And what we argue is that, you know, even while you're reducing interest rates and therefore increasing the value of holding illiquid assets, increasing the value of leverage, if you offset that in normal times by raising interest rates a little faster than you would otherwise do, then you equalize incentives because then you're creating a disincentive to holding illiquid assets, you're creating a disincentive to higher leverage. So instead of doing it by committing not to intervene, you do it by committing that if in case you intervene very sharply, you will offset that a little bit that as times normalize, you won't wait too long, you will raise or normalize interest rates a little faster to offset the effective put option you have given banks, okay? So um, uh, essentially, uh, don't worry about the details of the slide. The bottom line is you increase the, the pace at which you, uh, you raise interest rates to offset the bad incentives. Does this have anything to the world as we see it today? I leave it to you to interpret uh, what this implies uh, uh, for the world. Uh, and uh, and uh, the thing to think about is have we created enough of uh, um, essentially a put option uh, through monetary policy? Again, it may not be a bad thing because that may be the best way to resolve illiquid situations but it does create some perverse incentives. Have we done enough to offset those incentives? Two methods, ex ante regulation, exposed action by raising interest rates faster. Some mix of the two could be considered in order to offset the bad incentives. So the bottom line of both the papers, and I'm gonna stop once I go through this, banks are fragile and naturally, structurally constructed to be prone to failure. That's the starting point. But this is a good thing because it allows banks to promise a higher um, uh, payout, implies that the cost of financing is also lower and leads to greater financing in the economy. The fragile capital structure is not an aberration. Uh, it is essentially uh, uh, necessary, okay? Uh, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Is that the way to say it? It's not a bug, it's a feature of the model, okay? So, um, um, and in this kind of structure, when there's a liquidity shortage in the economy, it can create problems for the banks. And I can, I can restore solvency by acting on a bank by bank basis. But if as the central authority, I stand ready to bail out the bank, I'm 
very much in the position of a capital provider. And yesterday we saw when you have a capital provider, it softens the constraint for the banker and a lot of rents can be extracted by the banks. That's exactly what happens here. And even though the banker can give it back upfront through higher leverage, essentially it doesn't help and in fact can make the system worse off. Um, capital requirements uh, could limit failure, but as I pump the capital requirements higher and higher, I increase the cost of financing for the bank. That's what we went through yesterday. And again, that may limit banking activity. Uh, of course, if the banker doesn't respect those capital requirements and find ways to make his assets more illiquid or raises leverage through hidden ways, effectively capital requirements are not useful. So in this kind of environment, monetary policy may be a useful instrument to deal with banking system stress. But the problem with monetary policy is, again, it breeds bad incentives up front for the banking system. The way to deal with that might be to be in situations where you cut interest rates rapidly to deal with the problem, be uh, open to raising interest rates a little faster to offset the initial problem. All this is assuming, of course, that Central banks are only about dealing with banking crisis, not about dealing with inflation. So inflation is in the background, There's something else going on there. But uh, that's what I meant about matchstick models. We're focusing on dealing with crisis rather than on the issue of inflation. So let me, let me stop there. And uh, perhaps given the more complicated uh, model today, there may be more questions that I can answer. So thank you very much.